To those of you who have gathered at our, at our campuses today, to those of you who are joining us online, welcome. I welcome you to this study series called Pace Setter. Pace Setter. As in the one who sets the pace for the race. And so since we're on this theme of running, before we dig into the text today, I want to make a, a quick push, a quick plug. I want to remind you of the annual Project Nick Run for Shelter. All right? Now this is hopefully not a run for shelter, but this is a run for our Project Nick shelters. That's, that's what it's for. Some 250 orphans in six shelters in five different countries. And this is one of those events where we do something fun to raise some resources that helps take care of those kids. So all kinds of opportunities there. It's a couple of weeks away, but I'm giving you the warning today because if you're going to do it, you want the T-shirt, right? You want the T-shirt, and today is like the last day to sign up to get the T-shirt along with being able to do it. You can sign up after this, but you want the T-shirt. So for 40 bucks, you can come and walk the 5K, uh, run the 5K. You can bring your dog for the 5K, right? Yeah. For 50 bucks, you run the 10K. And then my favorite, for 60 bucks, there's the no K. No K. You get the T-shirt, you get to eat pizza, and you get to watch everybody else run. It is brilliant. It is absolutely brilliant. So even if you can't be at the event, you can support it. Because you can go on today, you can go to heartoflife.org, to the church website. You can go to project-nick.org and, and sign up there. Um, you can click on the QR code that you see at any of our locations today. Go to what's happening, and it, there's a place where you can register. Even if you can't go to the event, you can support it. You can support it with the resources and then get you a T-shirt and wear it around, and you can tell other people what Project Nick is all about. That run is important to us because it's tied to a bigger race, the most important race that today we're going to get a little more help from God's word in how we run it. Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, we're going to look at two verses today. Really, we're just going to look at one. I'm going to do the first one this week and the other one next week. Originally, I was going to do it together, and then Peter preached last week, which gave me a whole other week to study, and now I got two sermons out of one, all right? So I'm, I'm doing that for you. Here we go, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. We'll come back to that. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. But our citizenship is in heaven. The little word but we recognize links us to something that's already been said, right? Something's been already, it's been given in order to say, but this is for us. Well, what is the line of thinking that Paul has been building in this chapter three? Here's, here's what he said. He said, first of all, I'm pressing, I'm pressing on to know Jesus, right? I'm pressing on to know Christ. That is the most important thing in Paul's life. He wants you to recognize it is the most important thing that can possibly be in your life. Ultimately, that means at the resurrection, I get to see him face to face. But even in the meantime, between now and then, even in suffering, I get to know him more. I'm pressing on to know Christ. So Paul says, follow my example. I'll be your pace setter. That's where the title of this series comes along. I'm, I'm running hard after Christ. I want you to come with me. Follow me. Follow my example. I'll be the model. Because not everybody does that. 
Many live for earthly things. That's what we saw last week. They live for earthly things. They just live for now. But our citizenship is in heaven. That's the line of thinking. That's the line of thinking. I'm pressing on, so follow my example, because you don't want to follow the example of everybody. Our citizenship is in heaven. What does that mean that our citizenship is in heaven? Let me give you three little phrases. The third one we're going to hang out on. First of all, it means our heart's there, because that is our home. That's our homeland. That's where we belong. I understand that we're here, but that heaven is where our heart is. Two is where our king is. We'll talk about that in a minute. He has gone to prepare a place for us, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. Our king is there. He's coming back. We'll talk about that a little bit today. But third, and this is really what I think Paul's getting at in this text, our customs are there. In other words, the customs of our homeland are supposed to determine how we live here. That's the point. The customs of there are supposed to dictate how we live here. There's one other place that Paul uses this unique word citizenship, and it's also in the book of Philippians. We looked at it way back in chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Look, look at what it says. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves. That's the word. It's not translated citizenship there, it's, but it's actually the verb that, 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 that means... Um, it, the actual Greek word sounds like political. When you actually say the Greek, it sounds like political. And we hear the word political and we run for shelter. But in that day, it wasn't a negative context. It's a word that referred to how citizens lived in a particular country, in a particular state. And I'll remind you, for those of you who have been with us on this journey all the way through the book of Philippians, Philippi was what was called a Roman colony. And so even though they're not in Rome, those who lived in Rome, it, they are Roman citizens. They were protected by Roman law. They spoke Latin, right, the language of Rome, that they wore Roman clothing. Even though they didn't live in Rome, they live in another land, they are, they are dictated by the customs of Rome. Paul is playing off of that. And he's saying, I want you to think that way in terms of the kingdom of God. As followers of Jesus, don't let the customs of this world define how you live. Live your life according to the customs of your homeland, which is heaven. A manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That is the way he chooses to define. What do those customs look like? What do the, what do the customs of the land to which we really belong, they, they are worthy of the gospel, right? That, that's, the, that's the phrase. They are worth the ultimate value, the good news of Jesus. That is what defines what our lives look like. In everything that we do, this is the filter through which it all moves. We want to live here, in a manner that is worthy 
of the good news of Jesus that he would die for our sins, that he was buried and on the third day arose, right? Though he was God, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on a what? A cross. That's what defines the customs of our homeland. So I say, how are we supposed to run in this world? I call it cross country. Because that's what it is. It's cross country. Everything. Everything, the manner of life, it is, it is defined by the cross. It is defined by this good news of Jesus who would, who would lay down his life for us. So every manner of life for us, our families are, are, to, be, are to be lived in cross country. Our, our churches operate cross country, neighborhood, business, art, entertainment, it is all to be governed, right, by what we see in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would love us in such a way, and therefore we love in that way. It's cross country. And there's one more thing he says. Go back to verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Maranatha, right? Come, Lord Jesus. Awaiting a Savior for what? Well, again, I think it's absolutely connected to what Paul has been given us. It's connected to what, what Peter unpacked for us last week. What was it that we learned last week? We, we got to make sure we're following the right pace setters because not everybody's following Jesus. Not everybody's pressing on in that way. Some are actually what he calls enemies of the cross. They reject, right? So what did they look like? I love the phrasing from last week. Their mind is set on earthly things. They brag about the wrong things, shameful things, he says. Their God is their desires, right? Not, not Sir God, what do you want? What, what is it that I want? That, that becomes the, the, the God of my life, but here's where it all landed. Their destiny is what? It's destruction. This doesn't end in life. It ends in destruction. The wages of sin is death. Life without Jesus is death. And so those who are enemies of the cross, they await destruction. But we, we whose homeland, right, is to come, we who live, right, worthy of the, the gospel, we await a Savior who rescues us from that destruction. Paul says it again in another place, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says it this way. I, they, they tell how you, he's talking to them, describe, they tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Watch where he goes. And to wait for his son from heaven. Same language. Whom he has raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. I'm not sure that we talk enough about God's wrath. A holy God, a God who is perfect in every way, I mean, you understand that means there has to be a holy wrath against sin. You can't have a holy God who's just indifferent to something that drives you from him, right? You, you can't have a God who, who in all his goodness is just 
uh, uh, oblivious to, to the, the, the very thing that, that, that leads you not to life but to, to death. When we talk about the wrath of God, this is not an angry retribution. This is a righteous judgment against the very thing that separates us from him. At the cross, at the cross, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God on my sin. Yes. At the cross. And so for those who place their faith in Jesus, the wrath of God has been satisfied that he took that for us. But it's not just that he rescues us from something, destruction. The text goes on to say today that he also rescues us for something. He fits us with new bodies for our homeland. That is better news than you can imagine. Next week, my plan, if I'm still around, is to talk about that. Next week, I want to I wanna unpack some of that from Scripture, but it felt wrong to go there this week until we slow down enough and actually ask the question, are you really living cross country? Okay, we got it. We write it down, but okay. Does my life, is, is my life, does it look like cross country? Does it look like a, a manner worthy of the gospel? So this is about our sight. It's, this is about setting our sights in the right place. When you run, when you run, do you, do you look down or do you look forward? When I run, I do both. I do both. Looking forward is important because it's making sure that I'm moving in the direction I'm supposed to be moving. But if I don't look down within that process, it is dangerous because there are sticks and rocks where I run, and potholes where I run, which is everywhere, right? And so there is this combination when I run that, that there are times that I'm looking down and I can see the situations that exist in front of me. There are obstacles that need to be dealt with. And yet, when I run, I am consistently looking ahead, keeping me moving in the right direction. We are to do the same, I believe, when it comes to what it means to run in knowing Jesus more. We are called to run in this world. We are called to impact in this world. That means that there are obstacles in this world. That, that, that means that there are broken places in this world. In order to, to look down and to recognize the broken places that are around us, that's where we love. That's where we're saying, I am willing to follow my pace setter, who is Jesus, the one who was willing to be a servant, the one who was willing to put the interest of others above myself. I will follow him to be obedient no matter what it costs me, just like he did all the way to a cross. That's running cross country. But today, we are highlighting how absolutely essential it is to keep looking forward. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. So I look forward 
And I know there's going to be a day that Jesus returns, he takes us home. And you know what that makes me do? It makes me look down again. And I see that person in my life that God has allowed me to get close enough to but they don't know this news of a Jesus who is coming, of a Jesus who loves them. And because I can see that day is coming, I recognize this person in my path. It's time for me to share the good news, the good news of a cross where Jesus died, rose again. You see what I'm saying? The more you look outward, the more it reminds you there is a proper response to the obstacles that are in front of us, to the needs that are in front of us. We look out, we look down, and we love. We look out where we are loved, we look down, and we love. That's the pattern. Can that be difficult? Absolutely. But Jesus has already run that path, and he said, follow me, follow me, follow me. Before long, believe me, before long, it'll be cold again. I know it's kind of hard to believe this time of year, but there were a couple of mornings this week where I think we squeaked into the 59-degree range, right? And when that happens, it it starts to feel right for me. Before long, it'll be cold. And at some point, I'm going to find myself in the near future shoveling this white stuff, right, called snow. And I'll find myself scraping this stuff called ice, right, off of, off of windshields or doors or, or, or something, right? We recognize those, those moments come. So, so when those moments happen, and they do, and you find yourself, right, stuck out in the, in the cold, there's this little thing that, that, that I will do sometimes. I think about my fireplace. I like my fireplace. I do. It's, it's one of the things about winter that I truly just truly enjoy when I'm out there in the cold and my hands are freezing because I'm scraping ice or I'm shoveling snow or what I think about my fireplace and I think about sitting on the front step of that fireplace and the wood is crackling and I can feel the warmth on my nose that is frozen and my hands are, are starting to 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 thaw, I I imagine that I have have now put on the most comfortable, right, clothes that that, that I can possibly find in 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 my closet. There are soft socks wrapped around my toes that I currently cannot feel, and I am sipping the strongest coffee on earth. But when I'm scraping ice and shoveling snow, here's what I know. Not yet. Not yet. Which keeps me shoveling and keeps me scraping and keeps me running. Can I simply tell you, if you will be willing to stay in God's word, seriously, if you will be willing to stay in God's word that on a daily basis, you are reading what God has to say, you you are studying what what God has for you, can I tell you more times than you, you can imagine, he will remind you, you got a home, it's not here. You have a homeland, this is not it. Just like in today's text, it's like all of a sudden in the middle of Philippians chapter 3, we're going to talk about heaven. All of a sudden in the, in the middle of this little letter, he's saying, I'm going to remind you, you got to keep looking forward. If you're going to run this race the way you're called to run, there's heaven. And on that day,
the news will no more be about the kings of earth or wars or political moves. Yes! On that day, the news will not be about the dollar or pounds or euros or yen. On that day, the only story will be the story of our great God and King. And on that day, the heroes that we will celebrate as heroes will be those who have been the missionaries in taking the good news of Jesus, not only to the other ends of the planet, but those who would take it across their driveway, take it across the street, take it into their, into their school. It will be the heroes of heaven will be the missionaries who ran cross country. And they lived lives worthy of the gospel. And we groan to get there. That's the way the scripture describes it. We groan to get there. And that helps me keep looking down. And looking around to say, okay, today, today, what am I going to do today that can carry all the way? to my homeland, right? What, what is it that my life can be a part of today? Who can I love? How, how can I give? Do you understand why it is so important that you get the right pace setters in your life to help you run this way? A couple of the Gospels tell a story, a story of a, a dinner that occurs. Jesus arrives at Bethany, and John gives us names. He says it was a dinner that was put on by Simon the leper. Now, he's no longer a leper, otherwise there wouldn't be a dinner going on at his house, but the picture that we seem to have is we've got a man named Simon whom at some point in Jesus' journey, most likely he healed. And Simon's not a leper anymore. And so knowing that Jesus is going to be in town in Bethany, he, he, he calls for this dinner and, and, and people are at his house and they are reclining, it says. Uh, that day, dinner was so far away from fast food. People would gather and recline around the room and conversations would be had. A part of what would happen is you can imagine people reclining around a room. They got there by walking typically from wherever they came from. Their feet were nasty. So it was just customary that a servant would often wash the people's feet. Sometimes they would even take a bit of perfume, like a drop of perfume, and, and put it on somebody's feet because perfume smelled better than whatever was actually on their feet that they picked up on the way getting there. It, it was just a part of the custom. But on this day, something far beyond the custom happened. For we are told that a woman enters the room, and again, John names names. It's Mary. As in Mary and Martha, remember them? And Mary doesn't just put a drop of perfume on Jesus' feet. It says that somehow she broke the the neck of that jar and she poured it over Jesus' head. And that perfume runs down his body and the writers declare that she, with her hair, wiped his feet. Now what made this particularly extraordinary 
is that this bottle of perfume, we're told, is worth some 300 denarii, which we'll just translate it this way. It's a year's wage. And I don't care what you make, that's a lot, right? Whatever your year's wage is, like, that's a lot. A, a full year, it carries you for a full year. Whatever that amount is, it's a lot. That's how much that jar of perfume was worth that she broke, poured it over Jesus' head. There's, in one place in the story, it says that there were people there who were indignant. It is the word for flaring nostrils. You ever seen a bull, like in a bullfight, and their nostrils are just flaring? That's the word. There were people that are so angry over what they just saw. And Judas, again, John names names. Like, like the early, early gospel writers don't name the names, but John, John kind of outlived everybody. So at the end, he's like, I'm naming names. He just names everybody. Judas said, we could have fed the poor. But we also know the context is given that Judas was also the one who was taken from the money bag. What in the world is going on in this story? Well, we are a week away from Jesus' death. And even Jesus' enemies had heard Jesus say, he's going to die and rise. But apparently when Mary heard, she believed. And I would say she had reason to believe because it is also the case that her brother Lazarus was reclining in that room with them. The same brother Lazarus who sometime earlier he had died. Remember the story? He was dead for four days before Jesus shows up. Jesus says, come on out and out walks Lazarus from a tomb. So when Mary hears die and rise, she believes it. And although I don't think she probably understood everything that the next week was going to unfold, I don't even think she probably knew it was within a week. I, I don't think she knew any of those details. All she knows is that Jesus is speaking about his life being given. And she anoints him for burial. Like, are we sure that's really what she's doing? I'm sure that's what she's doing, and here's why I'm sure. Mark chapter 14, verse 8, here's what Jesus said. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I'm sure. What in, the world, what in the world sparked this extreme, extravagant act of love on Mary's part? I would submit she is a lady who views life in cross country. And again, although I don't know that she understands that it will be a cross, she understands this prince, Jesus giving his life. She understands that there is something connected to Jesus willingly laying down his life. And so when she says, when he says, I I'm going to die and rise, it sparks in her this extravagant Jesus said, that's going to go on and on and on and on. Here's what he actually said. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we are. We're still telling her. And Jesus said it's going to go on and it's going to go on and it's going to go on and it's going to go on. That extravagant act, it, it, it is attached to the eternal now. The evidence is given in Scripture that in this race in which we 
run, to knowing Jesus better, right? Everything that is poured out for our lives in love for him, there is an eternal aspect to that. We're not living for earthly things. But those things are attached to the eternal. We are, in other language, storing up treasure in heaven. I, I start to wonder when I read the, the closing book of the Bible. And I love to read of those pictures that are painted there of, of one day as, as, as Truly, Jesus wraps all of this up just like he says he will, and the people of God are gathered together, and you, you read about the celebrations that are going to happen, right, on that day. People will come from the east and the west and the north and the south, and they will recline at the table of the kingdom of God. And we read in Revelation about how at one point it says they, they sang the song of Moses. Like, that's an interesting phrase. When you read the song of Moses, it's basically Moses saying, God did this, and God did this, and God did this. I just want to make you a little homesick this morning. I want to make you a little homesick that, so that you'll keep looking forward so that it'll make you love that worth. Could it be? If just like Jesus said, those things are eternal, that I imagine the people of God who gather on that day, reclining at the tables together with him. And Moses stands, and he raises his glass, and he says, let me tell you about a God who did this, and 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 before you know it, there is a, a billion, right, however many of God's people who suddenly there is a roar that makes arrowheads sound like a whisper, and they are praising, right, the goodness of our great God and King. And when Moses is done, the Mary stands up, and she says, did, let me tell you about a, a, a Jesus who did this, and he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and all of heaven rises and shouts with their loudest praise. Can you imagine? And Abraham gets up and he declares and, and the next gets up. Could it, we, you realize we could do that for like a million years, right? We could do that for like a million years of just the people of God engulfed in the arms of God, praising the God who rescued us and he brought us home. So when you raise your glass, what do you do? Well, I stopped using bad words. Well, good. That's good. You should. Because come on, bad words just show a lack of humility. Bad, bad words, right? Language that's disrespectful. It, it's not putting the interest of others. It's just lazy. So that should happen. But like really? In that moment... What did God actually desire to do through your life on the mission to which he called you? So much so that he put his spirit in you. So much so that he declared clearly the mission that is laid out before you. Man, on that day, 
You want to be able to stand and say, my God did this, and I saw my God do that. And the only way this could be explained is because God was true to his word. That's what you want to be able to say on that day. That's why the apostle Paul is pushing us, and that's why today I'm pushing you. You got to keep looking forward so that you know that day is coming, so that you will keep looking around you at the obstacles, at the struggles, at the hurts, And because you live in cross country, you know how to love. You know how to love. Is it crazy to think we should be living for that day? That day's coming. And I want my life to be fixed on that trajectory. That is why. Man, I want to love my wife in such a way because one day I'm going to look face to face with the Jesus who loved me enough to lay down his life for me and then just simply said to me I want you to love your wife like I loved you I want to look in his eyes on that day and said I pressed for that with everything I had and when I failed I pressed on When I failed, I pressed on. This is the reason. This is the reason that those of you who have little kids, you don't come home from work and just plop in a chair and watch TV all evening. These are the reasons that you get in the floor and you play with your little ones. You wrap them up in your arms because you want them to know about the God who wants to embrace them for all of eternity. And so you give your heart and your life and your actions to them that you may share with them the good news of a Jesus who loves them. And on that day when you see him face to face, you will be glad that you ran that race with everything you had. This is why we handle our money the way we handle it. Come on, we all can live for now. We all can just live for earthly things. But because of that day, because of that day, that helps me determine how I want to handle those resources that God gives me now. Some of us, I'm afraid today, We're singing the words, come Lord Jesus. And I'm going to ask you, are you sure? Are you sure? Are there some things that need to change in us? Are there some things that he wants to shape in how I'm running? And when are you going to think about that? When, when are you going to think about that? When, when are you really going to get godly people around you to help set the pace for you to run this? Like, it's like, this is a great series, Jeff, and we're learning about pace setters. And No, when are you going to be intentional about putting people around you to help you run this race? When are you going to speak the gospel to your friend? who if Jesus were to wrap it up now, they don't know it. Like, when are you going to speak it? When? When are you going to speak it? That day should lead us to go today, today. Jeff, if you'll go ahead and wrap this up, all right? We're, we're going to go straight from here. We're, we're going we're gonna to make contact with whoever they are. It, it brings an, an immediacy to us, right? When, when is it? I, we, we talk about it. We know we, like, when, when is it actually going to change our spending? And we're not playing any guilt games here. I'm just telling you. Life to the fullest, when God gives you lots of resources, is that you are willing to run with those resources for his mission. What does that look like? When, when, when. How about now? 
Man, I love what happened earlier in the middle of that song of going to somebody and just praying for them, right? Praying that God will speak to them today. I love that. And I love the fact that you would do it. I love that. I think that's how God's designed us. How about we flip it? Are you today like desperate enough wanting to know Jesus more that there are those things in your life that need to change and today you would simply go to someone that you trust in this room and say will you pray for me will you pray for me I'll be here I'll do it for you I'll be right over there but there are people in this room and to do that together what would happen if God's people go to their knees and run. Run. God, the fact that it is so, that there is a place a place for all of eternity with no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more sickness, no more sin. A place, a real place where we get to see you face to face, where we get to feel the embrace of a, of a Jesus who, who died for us and rose again God, I thank you today for reminding us we need to be reminded often. God, today, will you help us in light of that day that is coming, that we would be willing to say, when? Today. Today, God, will you change my heart? God, today, will you change this discipline in me? God, today, will you change this action? God, I'm asking across this room, I'm asking to, in every campus, I'm asking in every household that hears today, God, that you would do something God, supernatural in this moment that causes us, God, wanting to know you better. God, would you do it? On our knees, we ask now in the name of Jesus.